bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Father, we do thank you for another beautiful day. For this is the day the Lord has made. And I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you for bringing us out today again. Thank you for those that are watching the services over the YouTube or Facebook page or the website. Thank you for these that are here in the sanctuary. We just give you glory, honor, and praise. We know, Father, that you have not forgotten your people. We know that you still love us. We know and believe in our heart that you are waiting for us to surrender and say yes to the Lord. And you have promised that you will make our path straight. Thank you for bringing us out together again today. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for the joy of the Lord being our strength. And even today, Father, we decree signs and miracles and wonders. We decree and declare burdens are being lifted. Afflictions are being lifted. People are being made whole in the name of Jesus by the power of your holy word. Thank you, Lord, for breaking chains. Thank you, Lord, for setting captives free. Thank you, Lord, for delivering and loosing the bound. You're breaking every chain. Now I praise you for this moment that we get to share with your people. I ask you now that you would touch every heart, those that are listening. Let your word minister to them, encourage them, and inspire them in the things of God. I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh Lord, are my strength and my redeemer. And we declare it and we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody say amen. 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 And amen. God bless you this morning. God bless you this morning. We're so glad that you are here. Glad that you are here. Thank God for our 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 drummer being back in place. I'm gonna talk to him. He might be like like being back home more than he like being in the <laughs> It's all right with me. <laughs> well, we welcome him and thank God for him being with us again today. So God bless you. I'm glad you're here. Again, thank you for tuning in and thank you for watching. As we continue this series this morning concerning the valley experience the valley experience remember i gave you reasons why we go through the valley experience i'm calling your attention this morning to again to exodus chapter 16. let's go there swiftly exodus chapter 16. and i'm going to start reading I'm going to start a reading from the seventh verse this morning. Exodus 16. And I'm going to read about 10 verses. And again, we're talking about the valley experience. What does it do for us? Is there a real cause? Is there a real purpose? We're starting reading. And in the morning, I'm in the NIV version, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord. This is Moses speaking to the children of, the, of Israel. God has spoken to them after he left Egypt, and now they are sojourning through the wilderness. I call this like their valley experience. He says, because he has heard your grumbling against him, who are we that you should grumble against us. Verse 8 says, Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning. Somebody say, God provides. God provides. Because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Anytime you begin to grumble and complain about God's people, that's the same as grumbling and complaining about God. Amen? Yes, he says, you're not doing it against us, you're doing it against the Lord. Verse 9. Mm -hmm. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. He has heard your grumbling. Another word for grumbling would be like complaining or 
uh, being disgruntled about what you have and not having enough to, to meet your needs. He says, call them. They looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. Wow. The glory of the Lord. Like I told you, one of the first purposes of the valley experience is to show his glory and to test us. To show his glory. So they looked in the cloud. Verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight, you will eat meat. In the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Why is this significant? This is very significant here in this passage because, see, the Israelites, when they were in Egypt, they learned a craft. They learned how to grow crops. They learned how to harvest their crops. They learned how to do all this sort of thing because in Egypt, the ground was fertile and there was rain. They understood how to get water and they had rain coming just right on the Nile and they were able to do their crops and grow. They understood that. But now, here they are out in the middle of the desert where there's no water. They don't know how to grow any crops, brother. They don't know how to plant anything because it's in a dry, barren land. And sometimes, y'all hear me, sometimes, 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 God allow us in our life to get to that place where it's just a dry, a barren place where we don't understand it, we don't know what's going on, it's just vacant, and we don't have the answers. He will allow it because he's trying to get a message to us. Mm. Let it verse uh, 11. So the Lord said to Moses, Again, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight, oh yeah, I read it, you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. Then you will know, because you have no way of providing it for yourself. <laughs> the Lord says, I'm going to have you in this valley experience, and you will have no other means of protection, no other means of provision, except by what I provide. And I'm going to provide it in such a way, you will know that this must be God. Because we can't do it ourselves. 13. That evening, just like he said, quail came and covered the, the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. What was that? 14. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. Wow. 15. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. In other words, the Lord promised bread. God has provided bread. And I think for all of us, when we are asking, we are praying and believing God for something, God will answer it. And when he does, we don't want to take the credit ourselves. We want to give all the glory to who? All the glory should go to God. He told us he was going to do it. When he does it, we ought to give all the glory to our God and say, Lord, thank you for your provision. And not only give glory to him, but we ought to tell the people around us, those that are watching our life, this is what the Lord has done. That's how you give glory to God. You know, oh man, you know, I did uh, matriculate through the greatest school, and you know, I have my degree, and therefore I went out there and I worked and I saved my money. You know, that may be true, but you ought to be giving the glory to the Almighty God. In that way, it's just kind of like giving. When I give Him glory, He bless me and do more for me. When I give Him my office, I have a result of what I've labored from. He blesses me and prospers my way even more. Because I'm giving all the glory to God. To God. Amen, right. amen, amen. What verse I'm on? 16. So then, 16 is the verse, and I'm almost there. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omen for each person you have in your tent. In other words, you're going to take a, a, a basket for every person you have in your tent so that they'll all have provision. He didn't tell them to take no more or no less. Sometimes we get greedy. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we're about to do a food drive coming up this weekend. And, you know how sometimes people have, they, they, it's only three in the family, but they'll put down all kind of different addresses because they're trying to collect for everything. <laughs> they try to collect extra. And you know, well, let's be, but we're going to be honest about this. We're going to take what we need. God has provided it. We're going to only take what we want. What we need. Amen. Amen. So the 15th verse, he said, Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given to you. 16. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is together as much as they need. Again, take an omer for each person <clears throat> you have in your tent. 17 is my concluding verse. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much. Some gathered love. And basically that was based on their household. However many was in their household, they took that which they needed. God bless the reading of his word. Sanctify his word in our hearts. And you here in the sanctuary may be seated. Again, we are continuing the series. The Valley. The Valley Experience. <clears throat> Somebody said the Valley Experience. The valley experience. Again, as a definition, a valley experience is a season in your life that brings, uh, causes discomfort, it causes loss, it may cause grief, inconvenience, inconvenience, trouble, or sometimes even illness. Often unexplainable and unexpected. And oftentimes it has no uncertain time limit of how long it's going to last. Kind of like this virus we're experiencing, right? We're going through a valley experience. Otherwise, the whole nation is going through a valley experience. We don't have an answer for it. They say, oh, well, this time we're going to have a, a vaccine. Well, we don't know. And even if they have a vaccine, brother, we don't know whether the vaccine will work. I don't want it. Don't experiment on me yet. <laughs> we don't know whether this is going to work. Somebody took some kind of vaccine or something the other day, and they had some kind of crazy side effects. They said, oh, we got to hold up. Don't use me as a guinea pig. I don't want, don't experiment on me. I'm just going to try to stay clear, trust my God to keep me, and keep it moving. Amen? Amen. Yeah, so the valley experience is often unexplainable, unexpected, with no uncertain time limit. The valley experience often catches us off guard. You know, we were doing with the, before the pandemic hit, you know, everybody was flowering around and hanging out and having a good old time. The economy was on the rise and doing well, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, out of nowhere, well, they say it's out of China. Who knows? <laughs> out of nowhere, it came, and it comes to America. And here we are going through a pandemic experience, a valley experience, where people are losing their jobs, losing their homes, and there are, some of them are dying. We've lost over 200 thousand people now yeah. from this pandemic. Somebody say a valley, a valley experience. Yeah, the valley experience often catches us off guard, leaving us confused about life, confused about God, about love, fairness, and justice. <coughs> somebody out there right now, maybe somebody sitting and watching this, you're probably saying, where is God? If God has loved me so much, why is he allowing all of this to happen to me? This is a legitimate question. It's a legitimate question, my friend. Why is he allowing all of this to happen? And I decree and declare and believe by the time you listen to this series of messages that we have shared, that God has given me to share with you, you will have a clearer understanding concerning why this valley experience. Somebody say, you know what, I hadn't been sick in a long time, and all of a sudden I caught this pandemic. I am down, and I can't, can't hardly breathe, and all these things going through my mind. Where is God in all of this? Some examples of the valley experience, and I'm going to go over them briefly again. Could be trouble, loss of a job, loss of a child, a loss of a family member. Extended illness can come up in our life. Contested divorce, where it looks like one party is fighting the other. It looks like it keeps going on and on and on. And the more you kind of give into, the more they want. The other side keeps begging, I want more, I want more. And it looks like it's just nagging. It just keeps going on and on and on. Could be a wreck, an accident, 
You know, so I know many of us have been in accidents and when you come out of the accident, you say, oh, I think I'm okay. Then you start having symptoms. You start having whiplash. You start having back pain. Now you're going to the chiropractor and you go over and over and over and look like, is this, am I getting any better? Then you go to the lawyer. Let me get a lawyer so he can help me make sure these people treat me right. And it just takes a long period of time trying to go through all of these different situations to make sure justice is done. Sometimes you get justice at the end of it. Sometimes we don't. But it's a valley experience. Somebody say a valley experience. Valley. Valley. And what about discomfort? Nagging problems, again, that linger, seems to never go away. Again, problems with a relationship, a child going astray, ongoing problems in your life, look like one thing after another. What about pain, sometimes physical or psychological pain, trauma due to abuse of any kind that lingers? And you know about trauma, when you, somebody has been traumatized, especially as a kid, this trauma may not show up. The abuse may not show up for years in their life, but eventually it'll start manifesting itself. And get the kid grow up, become a, a young woman, a young man, and all of a sudden these issues start manifesting in their life. And look like it never ends. Say, so why me? Some of you out there may be saying, why me, Lord? Why now? Why me? What about inconvenience? Loss of your house or loss of income due to the pandemic. Loss of your job and you're struggling and you're wondering, you know, you, you, you got you to gotta go and get in the food stamp line all over again. After years of prospering and doing well, you find yourself struggling again. Somebody say a valley experience. Sometimes when you lose income or other possessions due to furloughs or layoffs. Sometimes people lose because of a fire, or a hurricane, or a flood. I think over in Puerto Rico, God bless you all, they are still struggling and trying to recover from the hurricane that they had a couple years ago. They thought they were going to have money, they are going to have funds from the government, they are going to help put their life back together. And here it is a couple years later, they are still struggling. Forest fires out there in California, they appealed for some money. First, they said, the federal government said, no, we're not giving you anything. You're on your own. But thank God, it looked like they might get some help. But that's like a valley experience. And again, the, it's like the whole nation is undergoing this valley experience. And lastly, it could be anything or any situation that tests our patience and tests our endurance. It tests our intellect. Because one time we thought, oh, we got it made. We're doing great. Look how great we are. We're doing better than any other country. Huh. And all of a sudden, the rug was snatched totally out from under us. So again, why does God allow valid experiences? We'll continue to take up from what we started last week. We told you last week, number one, to bring glory to the almighty God and to test us. We talked about Job last week and how Job suffered and after he'd been in a good place. He was one of the wealthiest men in all the East, the Bible said, and he had everything he needed. But one day, Job was tested. But not only was Job tested, God was glorified in it. Y'all know the story. God was glorified. Why? Because Job, he didn't backslide on God or give up on God while he was going through that valley experience. He held on to God. He kept on believing God. He didn't curse God like his wife told him. That's an advantage to being hooked up to the right person. <laughs> well, when you're hooked up to the wrong one, they might speak the wrong thing in your ear. And a lot of times we are tempted to listen to them, just like Adam and Eve. Oh, baby, come on and taste this. It's good. That's another message. But you know what I'm saying. We got to be careful who we are matched up with. Because sometimes, somebody say sometimes. sometimes. Who we matched up with will determine our success or our victory, even in this life. Oh, I'm my own boss. Well, you know, yeah, that's what, that's what the Adam said, too. And God told me I was in charge. 
<laughs> he was in charge until his wife came strutting in front of him and gave him that doggone fruit off that tree. He was no longer in charge. He just yielded like a little wimp puppy. Okay, yes, baby. Let me have it, baby. No doubt if we'd have took it to our wife, she probably would have asked questions. I know my wife would have asked questions. She said, well, what this is? What is it? Where it come from? How you get this? How you know it's good? You know. No, he just had to sit there and, okay, <coughs> yes, dear. Brothers, brothers, brothers. Make sure you don't be no yes, dear kind of person. Ladies, 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 don't be a yes, dear kind of person. If you have any kind of premonition in your heart that something might be wrong, you better ask questions. I know people right now are still in situations because they fail to ask questions. I'm not saying you're going to just rebel against your spouse. Don't rebel, but you need to be doing what? Asking questions. I tell my children, don't you just get mad to somebody just because they got a job and make a little bit of money, and you're just going to believe everything they say? No. If you've got doubt, chances are there is a reason for that doubt. You need to ask questions. But baby, why are you saying this? Why are we going to do it this way? Why can't we do it this way? Why are you saying it like that? Why, why, why? Sometimes people get in metagonated. Uh, what's my word? They get uh, frustrated when you're asking them questions. Well, that might be a more reasonable idea to ask more questions. <laughs> they try to brush me off, Reverend. Oh, don't worry about it. Why are you worry about it? Oh, no, no, maybe I need to ask some more questions. Go out and investigate myself. <laughs> so then, number one, to bring glory to our Almighty God and to test us. Today I'm using another analogy. I'm using the one with Moses. We've been studying in, in the life of Moses and the Israelites and how God had brought them out of Egypt on the way to their promised land, right? So let's look at the life of Moses. Exodus 16, which we have just read. They were coming through, you might call it a pandemic. When they came out of Egypt, they were excited, they were happy, everything was going well. They were glad to see that they were loose, been let loose from Pharaoh and the life of slavery and bondage. And now they are out there going toward their promised land, only to run into a situation. Somebody say a situation. <laughs> What's the situation, Pastor? Oh, I can't grow my own food out here. I can't grow my own water out here. And now we're in a situation. Hard dirt, ground, can't even plant nothing or grow anything. All I can do is look to the hills from whence coming my help. I do, I do not want you to think that this kind of route is easy. We always tell you here at Greater Faith, we walk by faith and not by sight. And I'll never tell you that's the easiest walk to walk. But I tell you one thing, it's the best walk to walk. See, it's not the easiest walk, but it's the best walk to walk. Because when I'm walking by faith and I'm trusting in God, God's got my back all through the valley. If I'm on the mountaintop, he's got my back. If I'm somewhere in the middle, God still has my back. So, look at this. I do pray that we will embrace the truth of the word of God this morning. In chapter 14 of Exodus, God miraculously opened up their Red Sea for them. Because when they left Egypt and they got out there and they were confronting the Red Sea and Pharaoh and his army was coming behind them, they did not know what to do. They couldn't climb over the mountain. They were, again, in a valley experience. And they realized there's nothing we can do. They had a few choices, though. Number one, they could have feared and start doubting God like some of them did and just give up. And a lot of them died and just give up. Or they could have believed God like some of them did and continued to believe and trust God. And God began to, when they got to the, to the river, to the Red Sea, God did what? He parted the water. That's another way that God got glory because God did something for them that they could not do for themselves. God parted the water because they had no other means of getting away from Pharaoh except God. Give them a miracle. You need a miracle in your life? Right now, I'm sure many of us do. 
But God is still God. And he can still give us what? A miracle. Amen. In these times of trial, adverse situations, disunity, and misery, it is very important we know and trust our Heavenly Father. I said in these times that we're living in, especially today, it's very important that we know God and trust God to deliver us. Because listen, even with all of the marching for justice, sometimes justice is still delayed. In the midst of all of the pandemic, sometimes it's still delayed before you get back to a good place. In the midst of all of the chaos that's going on around the country, whether it be with the political system or whether it be with the uh, injustices or whatever, it's enough to make your mind confused and discombobulated to the point somebody might say, what's the use? I've been trying to make stuff happen. I've been trying to do the right thing, but it's not working for me. And a lot of times people begin to give up and revert to other means of trying to find an answer. But that's not us. We will stand on our watch. And we will continue to keep our hand in God's hand and watch God bring about deliverance, just like he did then. Amen? Amen. If he did it before, he can do it again. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, the bottom line is just as important for us to keep our hand in God's hand and trust God, it's just as important for us not to allow Satan to start whispering in our ears. We already know he's a liar from the beginning. He's a deceiver. And he does not love you and he doesn't love God. I know he offers and dangles a little nice things in front of us. And sometimes we fail. Sometimes we yield to him. But hear me today, my brothers and sisters. Let's not yield to his old crazy tactics. Let's not surrender and give in to his old in your in those and little nice things that he's going to dangle in front of you. Because some of you are pretty vulnerable. You say, well, I don't have a job, and I don't have a means of taking care of my family. Only thing I can do, maybe I can sell some drugs. The devil is a lie. You will dig a deeper ditch for yourself. Do not listen to the devil's lies. Brothers, listen. Don't do that. You're setting a bad example for your children. You're setting a bad example for your spouse. You're setting a bad example for everybody that's around you. Plus, you causing other people to die. You said, oh, the pandemic killing all these people. And this, this, the president knew they were dying and they just falling out of their flies. Well, if you out there selling the drugs, you're causing people to die too. Lord, help us. Now I'm moving on. Somebody said, move on, Pastor. Yeah, I'm moving on. Yes, yes. So let's, let's not listen to the tricks of Satan. The Bible already told us he come to steal from us, to kill us, and to destroy us. And in the end, we'll wake up in hell. God forbid. Let's listen and trust the Lord. Amen? Amen. I'm moving on. So ultimately, again, Satan wants to crush our faith and get us to that point where we lose hope and don't even try to serve God anymore. He wants somebody to say, well, what's the use? I might as well just do what I want to do because this ain't working. Oh, yes, it is working. Just like it worked for the Israelites, just like it worked for Job, it is still working today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes, it's still working today. Yes. Yeah. Moses to show you how God is glorified even when we go through our valley experience and we are tested. Moses has another good example of it as we read today. Like Moses, God already knows our strengths. He already knows our weaknesses. He knows our vulnerabilities. You don't have to tell God, well, oh, Lord, I can't do this. I'm not able to do that. God already knows what he's put in you. He already knows that he's already made you and capable of handling whatever comes your way. And that's a good thing, isn't it? I said, he already knows I've deposited strength in you. I've deposited courage in you. I've deposited faith in you. You just got to believe God even as you go through your valley. Don't let fear take over because fear will try to take over. Let's not let fear take over, but let's believe God to the point where even if I have to walk afraid, I'm going to walk afraid. I'm going to walk afraid, but I'm going to keep on walking toward God. Amen? Amen. Somebody say, I'm going to walk toward God. Toward That's God. right. If you're going to walk, even if you're afraid, just keep walking toward God. 
Yeah, yeah. At times we may think we are strong and courageous already. I know that's what some of us think. I'm macho. I'm strong already. I don't really need, need no valid experience to prove nothing. I'm all that. Well, not so fast. It is like this. We don't know how strong we are or how weak we are until we go to a test. The test proves how vulnerable we are. The test will show whether you're strong or whether you're weak. The test will prove whether you're vulnerable or whether you're more than capable. The test will show this. A lot of times, you know, as a kid when I was younger, I'd have James and we'd go out there on the little basket, put a little basketball goal up, and we'd go out there playing ball. You know, hey, when he was 13, 12, 13 years old, I played. So it made me look like I was a superstar on the court. <laughs> I would dribble the ball and knock the ball and all that, you know, against him. But after he started getting a little older, he realized, I guess, you know, I'm not able to do it for him, no dad now. <laughs> he was all that now, don't, 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 don't get that. <laughs> but the bottom line was, when he, at one moment, he thought I was a superstar on the basketball court. But as he got older and he got a little taller, he began to realize, you know what? As I watch basketball on TV and watch this stuff, God bless you guys, he began to realize, wow, oh, maybe, maybe Danny wasn't all that good. Because he began to see some little vulnerabilities there. And that's the same way in our Christian walk, folks. When we're walking with God, we get born again. Sometimes we feel like, oh yeah, I can conquer the mountain. I'm strong in the Lord and I know what I'm doing now, but not so fast. Israel thought they were strong. They thought, well, we already planted crops and knew how to do stuff in Egypt. We all right. We know how to do it. Just get us out of here. And as soon as they got out of there, they realized how vulnerable, how frail, and how weak they were. Why? Because that which they knew and were familiar with was no longer there. They were used to growing crops in fertile land, in land where that stuff was going to grow and mature. But now they're out in the wilderness where it's dry and no water and it's just desert, hard clay dirt, no doubt. Now they find themselves vulnerable. They saw themselves not even capable to do the least of things, and that is to grow crops, which is what they were used to and accustomed to doing. They saw that we are not as strong as we thought we were. So what am I saying? God had to prove this to, to the Israelites. When they began to complain about their valley experience, God had to let them see that, listen, you're not ready. You're not ready to go in and start conquering the Jebusites and the Hittites and all these other heights that you got to cross over to get to your promised land. You weren't ready to do it. So God said, I'm going to take you through the wilderness. And I'm going to take you the long way around. No doubt some of you out there are complaining. You say, oh, I, meant, I intended to be married by now. I intended to have this much money saved up. I intended to done have me five houses by now. And I was going to live in one and rent out the other. And I'm losing all, the, all of them. Don't worry about it. God has not changed. He's the same God that blessed you before. He can bless you again. Listen, like I told you last week, Job lost everything, all of it he had. And he had thousands. Today he would have been a multimillionaire probably. And God allowed him to have a valley experience where he lost all of it. But Job's hope was not in the things. His hope was not in the material things of life. Not in his money and the cattle and all of that stuff. His hope was still in Almighty God. And just like God allowed it to slip away, God restored it back to him. So God saw him, God tested Job's courage and his faith, and then God was glorified because Job stood the test, and then God worked miraculously and blessed him back and gave him, the Bible said, more than he had in the first place. That's the kind of God we're serving, folks. So let's look at this now. Let's look at this. At times, again, we might think we are strong and vulnerable. Listen, we are not that strong. Our strength only comes through God and his power, through the faith that we have in our God and his power. That's where our strength is. Sometimes we find ourselves, and listen, sometimes we are strong in one area, and we think 
That means I'm good in all my areas of my life. But that's not necessarily true either. Sometimes you can be real good and strong in this one area, but then you go through something else and you fall flat on your face. It's kind of like Elijah. One day he was recalling down fire from heaven and all that and slewing all these prophets. The next day he's running from a little weak woman called Jezebel. Okay. So we are not all of that. Our hope is only in our almighty God. Amen? Amen. Our hope has to be in our almighty God. So look with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8 real quick. Let's see why didn't God get them through this valley experience a lot sooner. Let's look at Deuteronomy. Yeah, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 real briefly. Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm just going to read two verses of that. And let's see, why didn't God just get them there fast? They, you know, one commentator said they could have gotten it in, in less than a week. They could have gotten across to the promised land in less than a week. But God didn't take them that quick way. God took them the long way around. And sometimes, my friends, when I say sometimes, Sometimes God will take us along the way around, but that doesn't mean God is not with us. I heard somebody say it took them so many years to graduate, took them so many years to get through the college and all that. Listen, that's all right. You got through, didn't you? And sometimes you might have, even though it took you a longer time, you might have gained more by having it to take you a little longer. Maybe you had a better understanding of what you were dealing with. So let's not knock the time frame. Let's just hope we are still in the hand of God while we go through the valley. Amen? Amen. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. It says, be careful to follow every command. God was telling Moses and the children of Israel, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase. Somebody say, live, live. and increase. <laughs> so you don't just want to live. You don't just want to survive. You want to increase. Amen? Amen. And may enter and possess the land. Not only are you going to enter in and see it, but you're going to possess the land. See, a lot of times we get to that place and we see it. And we get all happy because I see it. Yeah, I'm going to have this and I'm going to have that. But you don't want to just see it. That old, uh, the, the, the servant that was with, uh, with uh, Elijah, wasn't it Elijah? He saw it, but he didn't get to possess it. Remember the Lord said, to, told the prophet tomorrow this time, this thing's going to be open up, the food's going to be cheap, you're going to be able to go and eat again. And this servant, he had this audacity to say, well, if it happens, the Lord must be going to rain it out of the sky, because other than that, it'll never happen. But God heard that too. And he told the prophet, he'll tell him, you'll see it, but you won't benefit and that's the same way it happened in these with the Israelites. Some of them, they, they saw it, and they saw it coming, but they didn't benefit because they started walking in doubt and fear and unbelief. Let's see what God said. Why did he take them a long way around? The, the, the second verse, did I read the first, all the first verse? He says, so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised and owed to your ancestors. Verse 2, he said, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. Because it took them 40 years to get through it. Why did he do it? Number one, to humble you. Somebody say, humble me. Humble me. Well, listen, Israelites thought they had it all made. They thought they knew what they were doing. They didn't learn how to grow and harvest crops. And they were the best thing that the Pharaoh had. But when they got out in that wilderness, they realized, wow, we don't know nothing because we can't grow anything out here. We don't know how to do anything out here. A whole different environment. And God said, I led you that way so I can, number one, humble you. I'm going to take that chip off your shoulder. Take away that old pride and that arrogance because you think you're all of that and a bag of chips, as Kirk Franklin would say. <laughs> God said, I'm going to show you that you are not all of that. And sometimes, my friends, and I say sometimes, sometime. our valid experience is to humble us. When you get to the point where you think I'm doing it all by myself, I don't need God anymore because I got this, I got that, everything is going for me. God has a way of pulling the rug right out from under you and leaving you vulnerable, just like America is right now. And watch this, folks. I'm going to insert this parenthetically. We thought we were the strongest and the powerful, most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Well, listen, if we would have gotten attacked, God forbid, but if we would have gotten attacked by even the least of our enemies during this pandemic, 
we probably would have been in serious trouble. We would have been in serious trouble. But thanks be to God. So far he had not allowed that to happen. So he said, I brought you this way to do what? Humble you. He wanted to humble them. Otherwise, other strip away their little pride and their little arrogance thinking, I, I know what I'm doing. I did this before. I always knew. I was the best thing the Pharaoh had and he had his trust and confidence in me. I was one of his ring leaders over the band and I was serving and I was doing all this. We were doing this stuff. We knew what we were doing. God said, I'm going to show you. You don't know what you think you know. Mm -hmm. He said, I brought you out here to humble you. What else? He said, I brought you out here to test you. Again, you don't know how strong you are until you go up against a test. You and I don't know how strong we are until testing time comes. Mm -hmm. And guess what, folks? Testing time will come to every single one of us. Yeah. Every single one of us. I've seen pastors, you know, just kind of gloat and they get to a certain level and talk about how much they're doing and what God is doing, how much they done did. They don't say, God, oh, how many of you running, dog? Oh, I got 500. Oh, I got this, I got that, I done put this together. Pandemic came. Mm -hmm. What can we brag about? What can we brag about? We've never had this to happen like this in America. Reverend, what can you brag about? And you brag about, oh yeah, I still got this, I still got that. A lot of folks done lost their job. Could you brag about it? Some of them are threatening to lose their home. After they done put all kind of money down, thinking that was that's going to be their best home, and they done put all of their eggs in that basket. Do we have anything to boast about? Paul said, only in the Lord. Yeah. We can only boast in the Lord and what God has done, because as for James, I couldn't do it. I'm as vulnerable as anybody else. So he goes on to say, I brought you that way the long way around to humble you, then to test you. And a part of this test, folks, again, like I told you about the basketball. You know, as a rookie, playing against a rookie, I looked good. But now Israel were going to have to build themselves up, and they would have to get in some, get some exercise and build their strength and get in a position and learn how to fight because they had to go against other armies before they get to their promised land. <laughs> God said, I've given it to you, which is a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. But just that word give simply means I'm allowing you to have that. But now they still had to go in and do their part. And they had to be strong. They had to learn how to fight, had to use their little weaponry because the enemy was not going to just walk away and roll over. Some of you out there, you say, oh, yeah, well, God promised me this and God promised me that and it's taking a long time but that's okay maybe the reason why it's taking a long time that valid experience could be to prepare you because you probably not ready for that yet I'm probably not ready for that yet so God's going to take his time and mold us and shape us and groom us and prepare us because most of this stuff is to be mentally prepared some people are physically strong, but you go into a ring with another crazy guy to box. And if you're not mentally strong, if you don't believe you can mentally beat him, I don't care how strong you are physically, you're just going to fail. So part of this testing is to help you to get, become mentally strong. Not only just physically strong, but mentally. Somebody said mentally strong. Mentally strong. That's most of the battle. How what, Didn't the word say that? As a man or woman thinking in their heart, how do you perceive this? You know, I'm going through the pandemic. You can look at it one or two ways. Oh, it's taking me out. I guess I'll never bounce back. I don't think everything's going to ever change. It's going to always be bad. I heard somebody say the other day, I think it's going to be around forever. So they're probably almost to give up right now. But if you're thinking this, you know what? Even this is going to pass. I believe God is going to bring us back up again. I believe this is going to be over after a while. You got more optimism. Now that person say, I think it's going to be bad, and it's going to really be so bad. If they catch it, they probably die. Mm -hmm. Why? Because their thinking is going downhill. Y'all follow me? Yeah. They say, oh man, a lot of people dying from it. And you know, if I catch it, I don't know. That's doubt right there. 
and that's not to catch it. And oh, he's got a bad case of it. And brother, before you know it, you're in intensive care, and you barely recognize you're in intensive care. And then after while you pass out, you might come back through for a minute. But if your faith and your your mindset is doubtful, you don't have much to fight with. Somebody say, fighting requires energy. <laughs> It requires physical energy, emotional energy, mental energy, and it requires faith on top of that. So the bottom line is, listen, God is trying to build these people up and prepare them mentally even. Because listen, when they were working for the Pharaoh, they didn't have to do a lot of thinking for themselves. The Pharaoh was providing and giving them what they needed. They didn't have to go out and think every day, oh, let me see how am I going to go out and do all this. But the Pharaoh give them orders. They just follow the order. They just follow the order. But now, God is preparing them to think for themselves. And that's one of the serious things about being enslaved. When we are in sin, the Bible used that as a type of enslavement. The Satan has control. He has our thinking. And he's controlling our thought processes. And when we get born again, and thank God they were walking all over this morning in this Sunday school. When we become born again, now, depending on how long we've been doing it Satan's way, it can take us a while to become transformed in our mind. We get born again, and that's a good thing, but now to learn God's way and do it God's way requires more than just getting born again. I've got to start studying this word. I've got to intentionally. Spend time learning the word, whether it's in Sunday school, in Bible study, in the word, just reading the word. And i got to ask God, Lord, in, give me the revelation of understanding of what this means to me. That's how you begin to grow in the Lord and be strong. The Bible says those that know their God will be strong and they'll do exploits. But we can't do no exploits if we're weak in the flesh and we don't understand the word and the enemy comes to us with about something and all of a sudden he beat us up. Now we got doubt that we even saved. But he said, if I was so saved, I wouldn't be doing that. And now I'm doubting, thinking I am not saved no more. And it won't be long before I turn right back around and walk back into the wilderness. Our faith has to be stronger than that. The things God wants to do in our life, the places he wants to take us, church, we have to have a strong mentality. We've got to have a great fortitude. We've got to have a mindset to fight the enemy. It's kind of like the spiritual warfare, isn't it? That's what it is. Just like you got to be strong and have strategy to go out and fight the war. You know, being in the Navy over 20 years, we had to have strategy. We had to have tactics. How are you going to do this? We got to sit down and draw up plans. Y'all know about that. You have been, been around a while in the military. You had to have plans. You don't just go out there, oh, yeah, they're going to do this. You're not ready. Same way with God in the kingdom. God wants to prepare you before he launches you out there. He want to prepare us before he say, oh, yeah, I'm going to have you do this now. Because if I'm not prepared, if I don't spend time in the valley, the same strategies and tactics that I need in the valley, folks, I'm going to need those same strategies when I get to my better place. I got to have a strategy to help keep me there. Some people say, oh, yeah, I just want to be this. I want to make a lot of money. I want to do that. Oh, that's all well and good. But even with that, brother, it's going to require some mental fortitude. Prove it, Pastor. Somebody say, prove it, Pastor. Prove it, Pastor. God bless one, either one of us right now. And you just all of a sudden, you just instant millionaire. You know what? You got relatives coming out of the woodwork. Everybody going to come and running after you, trying to get that little bit of money, trying to get you to help them, trying to get you to do that. That's enough to make you crazy. Because every time you look, somebody want to borrow something. They want to get something from me. They want to do something for me. Now, you listen, and you're not, you, you, you're trying to be nice, but... How are you going to bail all them out? And then you got those enemies out there. They're seeking. Watch this. The enemies out there after you. They're trying to find a lawsuit on you so they can take some of your money. Then you got this other group. Of <laughs> You've got more problems trying to protect that little what you got than just living your normal life. And a lot of people, they say the person that wins the lottery, they're broke within five years. That's probably why. Number one, they don't have a system of setting up something where they can do some investing instead of just spending. 
Everybody coming to you, want you to give me this, let me have that, I'll pay you back. And before you know it, you're going to give away half of it. And you don't have no kind of profits coming back on that which you don't give away. And now you don't have the intelligence a lot of times to invest and strategize so that you can cause that which you have to make more money. And if you don't have that understanding, listen, money's just not going to grow by itself sitting in your closet. <laughs> yeah, I'm just had a, I'm put, even if you put it in the bank, the bank pay you point, point zero zero percent. Sooner or later you go bankrupt. So the bottom line is the Lord said, I'm gonna take you all a long way. Even though I don't want to, but this is the way I'm gonna have to take you, because I'm gonna test you. I'm gonna humble you. Alright? And I wanna prove you. <coughs> Well, are you going to stand for me or not? Now, let's spend a little time on that, proving whether you're going to stand for me or not. Listen, a lot of times in the spiritual realm, if God blesses people too fast, they get born again, and if God bless them too fast, son, you know what happened? As soon as they get in a good place, they get their first little new house, they're so excited about it. Oh, I look by my house, get to buy their first little new car. Now, God want to do a whole lot more than that now. They get that, they're satisfied. That's one case. They get that, they're satisfied. They're not concerned about nobody else. They're not concerned about why not I just let God bless me with five. Then I can rent some of them out and generate some other income. Then I can do more for the church. They don't think that way. Oh, let's let me get me my little first house. Oh, hallelujah. And we are happy and we are settled there. And then you got that other group. Well, I want the Lord to bless me. I want the Lord to bless me. And then the Lord start opening up some doors. He start blessing you. Bless you with that first house. Oh, hallelujah. And then you be able to go to the lot and pick out your nice car. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you think it's on now. And you just kind of kind of creeping on up the hill. And all of a sudden, they start looking for you. You were so faithful to church at one time because you didn't have jack. And all of a sudden, now that you don't start getting blessed, they start looking for you. Where's the parking committee? Well, he's not making it today. Oh, where's the usher committee? Well, she said they 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 going on a trip today. Now, this is one of the major Sundays they normally be in place. But oh yeah, they said they had to take some time off, so they're going for two weeks. Oh, where, where's brother so and so? Well, this was his birthday today, so he said he, he his birthday money, but he gonna start celebrating it today. So now brother so and so not here either, because God done start blessing them, and they realize wow. Oh, oh, you, I don't really have to be praying and being at church or all that like I used to because I'm blessed now. So sometimes, when I say sometimes, sometimes. God will delay those blessings. He'll hold up on those blessings to see like he did Israel, to see if you're going to be faithful to serve me or not. You go to a job and you get promoted. You know, they're not just going to give you the promotion because, you know, you barely show up on time. They're not going to give you the promotion because, oh, you know how to do the job. They're going to look at a plethora of things, aren't they? Are you there on time? Do you stay late sometime when we need you? Are you there showing other people how to work and do their job right? Are you taking a vested interest in the company? Or are you just there for yourself? And sometimes that's the way people treat God. They're only doing it because it's I want to get to the same place. So they say, if I do this for the Lord, the Lord's going to do this for me. Well, certainly that's what the Lord may have said, but he wants you to start loving him, not just for what you can get out of him, but love me with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and then love your enemies and your neighbors as you love yourself. That means when God blesses me and puts me in a good place, I'm not going to continue to be selfish like that rich man. He got everything he needed, and instead of saying, oh, how can I invest to help other people? He said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to tear down these old bonds, and I'm going to build me a new bond, and I'm going to put more stuff in my bond, and I'm going to say to my soul, so you have many goods stored up for many years, just eat, drink, and be merry. That, my friend, is not God's way. So now he's taking Israel the long way around through their valley experience to humble them again, to test them, and to get them to be committed to his way of doing things. And even after all of that, you know what happened? Some of them still died out because they didn't want to obey. Some of them still 
failed because they didn't have faith to believe God when they didn't understand what God was doing. See, we got to learn to trust God even when we don't see what he's doing. <laughs> He said, how can you do that, Pastor? Yeah, we got to learn to trust God even when we don't see what God is up to. Because sometimes he don't divulge all of his cards. He don't put all his cards on the table, Brother Mark, and say, all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Sometimes God don't show you all of that. He'll show you a little bit at a time because why? He want to keep you to keep walking in the right direction. He want to keep you encouraged and doing the right thing. But sometimes, somebody say sometimes, he does not show you his whole cards or his whole deck right up front. And for the same reasons I just mentioned. So the bottom line is God wants to bless you. And he wants a part of his blessing is to take you through that valley experience. So that, listen, when you do get to a better place, you will understand, you know what? I trusted God before when I was in the valley. I watched God deliver me when I was in this other dilemma. I watched God deliver me when I had problems with my kids. I watched God deliver me when I was on that job. And they said they weren't going to give me no raise. But I watched God move that old supervisor out of the way and put somebody else in. And they thought I was the best thing since sliced bread. And I got promoted. I watched God do some things while I was in the valley. So now when I get to a better place, I can easily trust him more. I can look back and say, look what the Lord has done. To know what was in your heart. If they would keep his commandments or not. There's much to be said about the valley experience. Such experience teaches us patience and humility. Israel had learned much while in Egypt. Again, they knew how to plant. They knew how to do a lot of things. But when they started walking with Moses, that was a type of deliverance. They had to learn how to walk with God again. Why? Because the scripture declares, God says, my ways are not your ways. Your ways are not my ways. He says, as far as the heavens are from the earth, so are my ways different from yours. So, you said, that's a dilemma too, right? Well, he says, you can learn me. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and do it. Learn of me. In other words, get into my word, get in a good Bible study, get in a good Sunday school class, and learn what I'm saying. Learn my ways. And now you can be solid in your faith, and there's a better chance of you standing even when the clouds come up against you. Even when trouble comes against you. There's a better chance of you standing. And then there's a better chance of you glorifying me because I'm not selfish anymore like I used to be. I'm not full of pride like I used to be. I'm humbled now. So it's a lot easier to serve God as an humble servant than to serve God like that rich man. He's all prideful because he had money. It's easier to serve him now because I've watched God take me through some things even when I was in the valley. And now I can believe and trust God more for whatever lies ahead of me. And my folks, I believe that's a good place to be. You don't know where you're going if you don't know what the past was like. But every time you can go back and look in your rear view mirror and say, well, you know what? I knew God was there when I was sick. He delivered me. I knew God was there when I didn't have a job and I thought I was going to lose everything. I watched God deliver me. I watched God bring me through. I watched God raise my children up. I watched God do all kinds of things. Now I've got hope. Now I've got more courage to keep on fighting a good fight of faith. Because even when I'm weak, I can depend on the power of God to be strong in me. And when I punch, it's not just my punch. It's the power of God punching for me. And we can knock the devil out. Amen. Put him on our feet. I encourage you today, church. Let's be like Moses and the children of Israel. Those, the good ones. <laughs> let's stand for God. Let's make up in our mind. Even though we go through the valley, let's make sure that, Lord, I'm going to hold on to your unchanging hand. You've got some young folk here, and you need to understand that too, my friends. you got to know that God is still my God. Temptation's going to come in the valley. All kind of situations are going to come up in the valley. But one thing we got to do, we got to number one, stay focused on God. we got to stay prayerful, knowing that the same God that brought me this far will continue to lead and guide me. 
And thirdly, allow the process to take place. Don't rush it. Don't try to make stuff happen. Just say, Lord, I'm in your hand and I am depending on you to get me through. Not only just get me through the valley, but bring me through the valley and get me into another good place again. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray for you. There may be some of you out there that's really feeling the effects of what you're going through. Look at it as a valley experience. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know, I think that's what it says, Romans 8, 28, that all things are working together for my good and for the good of the kingdom because we love God. Y'all hear me? And I'm called according to God's purpose. That's another thing that the valley will teach you. He loves you enough. He's not going to let nothing come against you that's going to kill you. But whatever he allows, it's going to come to help you, going to strengthen you, and going to make you whole. Isn't that good? Amen. Knowing that whatever he allows, it's going to make me better. It's not coming to tear me apart. Of course, I can fall apart if I want to, but it's coming to make me whole, to make me stronger, make me wiser, to equip me to do what God wants me to do tomorrow. My friends, if we can hang in there and believe God and walk in faith, even through the valley, like David said, yeah, do I walk through it? I don't have to fear because the Lord is with me. Amen? How many of you believe he's with us? Amen. Give God a praise if you believe he's with you. Amen. He is with us. He's with us. And listen, he done told me, he said, I'm not going to leave you, Hicks, and I'm not going to ever forsake you, so... Don't you turn away from God. He won't turn away from you. God bless you. I'm going to pray for you. If you would, just look this way. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word of encouragement to your people. And I ask you in the name of Jesus, Father, that young man, that young woman that are sitting on the couch right now, wondering how they're going to make it, what they're going to do. I pray, Father, that this word has spoken to their heart, that they will know without a doubt that you love them, and that you have their best interest in heart. I pray, Father, that if they are not saved, they will repent of their sins now. ask you to forgive them, come into their hearts, and make them a new creation in you. And those that are saved and they are struggling in their faith, I pray, Father, that you would let this word speak to them. Maybe they have to watch it over again and listen to it more carefully. But let them hear you saying, I am with you. I will lift you up. I will uphold you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. And my friend, if you are listening today, it's my prayer that God will not let you faint, that you will not give up like some of the Israelites did, but you will hold on to God's unchanging hand and you will get to the other side. And when we get to the other side, it will be better than what you experienced before. This is my prayer for you. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. God loves you. We walk by faith and not by sight. Have a blessed day. Thank you for watching.